Uh, I am delighted to be here and to kick off the first of our speaker series for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, we're virtual, but we are strong. I'm also delighted to have Dr. Destiny Thomas with us this evening. And before she speaks, I'd like to introduce your host for this year, evening, Professor Akira Drake Rodriguez, who is the newest member of our standing faculty, but no stranger to pen or pen planning. Hey, Akira. Um, Akira was the person who suggested that we bring in Dr. Thomas, and we're th really thrilled to have her. I want to thank Dr. Thomas for taking the time to be with us this evening. Thanks, all of you for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Akira, who's gonna kind of spell out what, what's gonna happen next. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I am honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Destiny Thomas, founder and CEO of the Thrivates Group. Dr. Destiny Thomas is the founder and chief executive officer of Thriving Group. She is an anthropologist planner from Oakland, California. Um, Dr. Thomas has worked for nearly four years um, as a Caltrans environmental planner and then for two years um, as a transportation planner with the city of Los Angeles. Dr. Thomas earned a bachelor's in political science from Fisk University and MPA with emphasis in public health and nonprofit management from Tennessee State University and finally a PhD and social and cultural anthropology from the California Institute of Integral Studies. She is also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I first came across Dr. Thomas's work this summer in an article she published in June with City Lab entitled Safe Streets Are Not Safe for Black Lives. She argued that pedestrian friendly street design without diverse public input can end up harming the commuters they serve. Um, Dr. Thomas and her thriving group have also been hosting the Dignity Institute, a project meant to develop capacity externally for creating more inclusive and anti-racist planners. So please help me welcome Dr. Destiny Thomas, speaking on the topic, In Search of Our Mother's Urbanism, A Womanist Call for Spatial Reparations. We ask that you place all questions in the Q&A and we will select a few at the end of the talk. Thank you very much, Akira, and thank you to the Wiseman School for having me. Um, I don't think I realized I was the inaugural speaker, so um, I'll add that to my list of accomplishments today. Um, I'm going to share with you all a little bit about the framework that uh, we use at the Thrivings Group and sort of the origin story that lends itself to that perspective. So. The title of this lecture is called In Search of Our Mother's Urbanism. It's a womanist call for spatial reparations. Before I get into this, I do want to talk a little bit about the Thrivings Group. We are a for-profit, socially responsible urban planning firm um, that is working in the interest of racialized people. And I like to talk about our origin story uh, because I feel like uh, we're, we're set aside um, often as, you know, a group of women of color, or a group of Black women who are sort of relegated to community engagement. And a lot of times folks struggle with where to place us, right, as people who are competitively showing up in the planning sector as consultants to do technical work while um, unrelentingly and, you know, really just with the full force um, and fully resourced <laughs> championing the work of racial justice, not just racial equity, but racial justice. Um, I got my start as a civil servant in planning. And I, you know, I'll often talk about what it was like to be the first black woman hired to be a transportation planner um, for the Los Angeles Department of Transportation in 23 years. Uh, and how on day one, the moment that I stepped into the building, I could tell that that was the case, not just because of uh, what was lacking, but because how other Black women treated me when they saw me walk through the door. There's something very curious uh, that happens in space when those of us who know, um, you know, the harm that exists between the four walls, see another black woman come in. It's a combination of uh, excitement to see someone that looks like you, uh, mixed with 
genuine concern. And I, and I remember what it was like my first day at work at LADOT several years ago, looking in the eyes of an elder who was working in a technical, in, in a uh, administrative uh, position, a support admin position and how she couldn't place me. She didn't know if she should be happy for me uh, or if she should be sad for, for what was to come. And, you know, that moment has happened to me time and time again uh, in many spaces. We joke within the Black community about the nod, right? Going places, walking down the street, walking into rooms. Um, but having to sit with that as a survival mechanism and an unspoken, uh, an inaudible language uh, just to get through the day um, was something that really inspired me as I began to think about what it would look like to do um, urbanism in a more radical context. So I've been blessed uh, with an opportunity to, to leave civil service just so that I can uh, create a new path and a new strategy uh, for urbanism that works for Black futures. And uh, I borrow a lot of my thinking, a lot of a lot of our practices at the Thrivens Group from uh, various critical race theorists, um, but also radical Black imaginers like Alice Walker and like Nikki Giovanni, who's from my, my alma mater. Uh, so I want to share with you what I've learned from them. And then when we, when we finish the, the formal, presentation. I'll talk with you a little bit more about the specific projects that we're working on at the Thrivance Group. And then and then I'd love to take some questions from you all. I can't see you. I am a social butterfly. So being in the Zoom environment is tough for me. Um, so please, if, if you are able to, to give energy and feedback in the comments, eventually I'll see them. Um, so please feel free to do that. I wanna start with a quote by Alice Walker. And so our mothers and grandmothers have more often than not anonymously handed on the creative spark, the seed of the flower they themselves never hoped to see or like a sealed letter they could not plainly read. This quote resonates with me when I think about what urbanism has become. When I think about commonplace practices like tactical urbanism, when I think about complete streets projects, when I think about the um, adaptability that designers and architects have had to show up in uh, during COVID-19, I think about all of the fixes and, and corner cutting and finessing that the elders uh, in my life, the women elders in my life uh, so beautifully did, so gracefully did. A lot of what we call innovation today um, stems from practices and skills that have been uh, criminalized and brutalized out of the hands and out of the minds of Black families by way of Black women. I want to start by talking about how this, this lineage of trauma gets us gets us to where we are today. So uh, the main street and the ma'afa. I'll talk to you about what ma'afa means in a minute. Um, but just sit and imagine for a second when we think about the various ways in which place has been a site, a location of harm for Black women. Place has been uh, routes designated to confine the movement of Black people being treated as cargo and goods certainly not as human beings, place as watchtowers to track and police the movement of enslaved people, to bring them back to their captors, place as town square for spectatorship of black trauma and lynching, and even the commodification of those images, place as slave quarters for forced laborers that are not even seen as worthy of decent living conditions, place as an agent of bondage Right? relegating someone to a specific geography just for the purpose of, of keeping them in bondage. Place is three-fifths of a human, the ways that place reifies the notion that Blackness is, is subhuman or not human. 
and then placed as the severing, the deliberate severing of kinship ties. So these are the ways in which our present day con context of place still matches uh, the original sin of this country, which is the transatlantic slave trade. The ma'afa is a Swahili term that means the great disaster, the calamity, the terrible occurrence. Growing up in Oakland, California, uh, I was taught the trans about the transatlantic slave trade a little differently than uh, I think what how most folks learned about it in school. My mother uh, was amazing about bringing other Black women into our lives and, and into our community um, to share multiple perspectives and strategies um, just a, around what it is to be a woman, what it is to be Black. But uh, one of the most memorable experiences I had as a, as a teenager um, growing into adulthood was the summer she forced me to take Black studies at a, um, at a junior college. I wasn't attending my classes in high school, so I was punished uh, with college classes in the summer. And I ended up in this professor's class uh, who, who taught the whole summer about the trauma of the Ma'afa. And it completely blew my mind. I had understood the transatlantic slave trade, slave trade from the perspective of uh, teachers, good teachers, um, but from a Eurocentric gaze, right? So all I knew about the transatlantic slave trade uh, was this mystical uh, way of severing families on one continent uh, with no rhyme or reason, the the transition of, of bodies um, in deplorable conditions to this continent, right? And then, you know, this period of time that is, is traumatic um, and perpetual Black victimhood. And then we end up with, you know, suffering Black folks today. That, that was the normative narrative around the slave trade in school. But what I learned from this college class was the beauty, not of our resilience, but of our resistance. Uh, black resistance is, is a language, it's a dialect, it's a body politic uh, that, that cannot be uh, removed or severed from the spirit of blackness. And the more I studied about uh, the trauma of the Ma'afa and, and how our ancestors were able to survive that, um, I, I constantly am coming across um, examples of how it was Black women who, while, while bearing uh, the most grave conditions, uh, the most traumatic traumas, uh, still managed to be the ones to create the maps, to create the strategies, to build the structures, um, and to reshape the notion of community to lead us to freedom. This is a, a snippet from this book called Slavery in the United States by, um, from the diary of an enslaved person, Josiah Henson, where he describes uh, what the living conditions were. And, you know, every time I read about chattel slavery, I think about the ways in which the built environment, um, the structures in which we lived and were required to maintain reinforced this notion or construct of a chat of chattel. Um, I think that this description does a great job. Wooden floors were an unknown luxury. Imagine floors being a luxury. In a single room, uh, people were huddled like, like cattle, 10 or a dozen persons, men, women, and children. We had neither beds, bedsteads nor furniture of any description. Our beds were collections of straw and old rags thrown down in the corners and boxed in with the boards, a single blanket, the only covering. Sometimes I hear people griping about what it's like um, to live in quarantine during COVID-19, and I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But, you know, I would just ask that people think about what it is like for those among us who um, are still enslaved, are still in prisons, um, still bearing forced labor, 
um, but also those of us who carry the generational um, trauma of this type of living condition in our bodies. What does confinement mean to people um, who are descendants of, of ancestors that survived these types of living conditions? The other thing I think about uh, when I think about the trauma of the Ma'afa and the ways in which place uh, was used to construct um, chattel was the way that reinforced that the ways that um, patriarchy and gender roles were reinforced very early on, um, while also multiplying the demand on, on reproductive labor, particularly for Black women. And so, even when this country, um, you know, evolved out of slavery as a business line, um, share sharecropping, its close kissing cousin, came about and while even black men were able to grab hold of notions of freedom um, and liberation, um, at least um, comparatively speaking, black women were um, asked to do twice as much work in order to, to shape um, and reinforce a new business line that was solely based um, in the field. And what black women did um, you know, during this era was not just manage the field and the home, but worked alongside their partners um, to build new models, new models of, of, of agricultural development, new business lines. There's a, a community in Fresno, Southwest Fresno, where we're currently working, um, which, which has planning documents that currently don't even acknowledge the legacy of Black agriculture, although Fresno is known for its agricultural industry. And, uh, you know, the, one of the intentions of that project is to counteract cultural and racial erasure. And so we investigated the origin story of Fresno from a place-based perspective. And what we found was that um, sharecropping in Fresno, which is a form of slavery. A lot of people don't talk about California as, as having slavery, but sharecropping in Fresno um, came about by way of forced migration from the Southern states, from the South to the West Coast. Um, and it was black women who encountered the environment there and decided um, that they would create a way to commodify the skills that they are that they were bringing from the South um, to entirely reshape uh, what we would consider agriculture. I mean, Black women really were at the forefront of industry in this country, and that's a, a narrative that is rarely ever ever told. After uh, sharecropping transitioned out, phased out, we saw an influx of Jim Crow laws. Um, one of which, at least spatially, was redlining. And a lot of us, I think, in this space know what redlining was. Um, it was a practice by which the um, there was a conspi conspiratory effort between uh, municipal, municipal government agencies, um, the housing industry, funders and banks, right, to keep Black people and other people in proximity to Blackness. Um, away from opportunities to generate generational wealth by way of, of owning real estate. But for Black women, that barrier to generational wealth did not only um, result in, you know, an inability to purchase or maintain a home. It actually increased the burden on Black women um, uh, to the extent that we have yet to see relief. These burdens included um, Black women because they are the reproductive laborers, not just of their households, but of their whole communities, having to um, travel three times as, as far and as long um, as they were prior to redlining, prior to the, to the introduction of redlining and the disruption of Black communities, uh, just to maintain the household. And, you know, while that might seem just like a mere inconvenience, I want to lift up two things. Number number one is that Black women still have this same travel pattern today. Those of us who rely on public transportation to move through space, especially um, our routes have more stops than our white counterparts. Our headways are longer than our white counterparts. 
and the conditions um, of travel are, are less desirable than that of our white counterparts. So redlining's legacy um, is still alive um, and bustling today. The second thing that um, is important to note here is that with this increased burden on just spatial navigation, um, we've seen negative impacts on health outcomes for Black women. So when we talk about why Black women have um, poorer or less, um, less positive um, outcomes when it comes to childbirth, right? Why Black women are more susceptible to death um, by way of childbirth it has a lot to do with the environmental exposure, the wear and tear on black women's bodies um, because of the way space has been designed and constructed um, to cause them to work more and on behalf of more people. Then we started to see, you know, when, when redlining became burdensome to even those who were benefiting from it, um, this gentrification of the inner city um, this migration of white people well, uh, and, and wealthy people back to the inner city. But it's not just gentrification that displaces folks. Um, it's mass incarceration, right? It, the, there's a community in Los Angeles, Highland Park, where we did an, a displacement study, an anti-displacement study, and found that um, the displacement of three generations of Latinx families um, in that part of LA had less to do with the rising cost of housing um, and actually was more um, correlated to um, a gang injunction that had taken place in the 80s. We did the study five years, three years ago. And so imagine 30, almost 40 years, 40 years um, after one policy is enacted, um, seeing generations of family, families disappear from a region that they built. We've also seen an increase in the criminalization of poverty. Um, what I mean by this is not just uh, what they call broken window policing, but also literal, literal criminalization of poverty. So creating um, programs like um, housing subsidies, Section 8, for example, that, that make it illegal for uh, the women in those households to build kinship with, with anyone that um, is gendered as a male. And what happens is this degradation of notions of kinship uh, that worsen um, all of the negative outcomes that, that I've already spoken about, but reproduce the trauma of the ma'afa, right? One of the primary uh, mechanisms of enslavement, one of the primary tactics was the breaking apart, the ripping apart of families, the segregation of families of, of uh, women from families in particular, their babies were cut out of their bodies, um, just as how um, many of our, our social services systems currently extract children um, from the mother's home uh, with no transformative justice process. Um, and then the men are kept, or the partners are kept from the mothers and the women as well. So women are, are expected to do the, do the labor of loving um, of rearing only to have their families taken away from them. This is reproduced through many um, place-based policies that uphold the notion of home and housing, especially in what we call the urban center, but also in rural America. Speaking of which, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, given that, that history of trauma in this country, um, the irony that the burden of placekeeping has still rested on the shoulders of Black women, even today, right? When we hear common narratives about this election cycle, um, it wasn't until yesterday that I saw a news segment that mentioned any other um, race in terms of who would decide the election. Um, but up until very recently, Black women have just been expected um, to uphold the status quo that's been really, really harmful for them, to them. And so while, while being keepers of home, while being keepers of the heart, uh, we're also expected, excuse me, expected to, um, to educate ourselves, to educate our communities, and then to also fight for justice um, when the systems that are supposed to be supporting them 
supporting us fail us. That's a heavy, a heavy lift. Some of the ways this shows up is through a constant threat of place-based harm. There are many examples of this, um, but this is a, an image that has never left my mind. In that same summer class that I was talking about earlier, um, I had the, the honor of, of meeting two women. Um, well, I met Pam Africa, um, who was a member of the original uh, MOVE 9. Uh, MOVE was an environmental justice, anti-racist, super, super sunflower, like we raise our babies on organic food, uh, cooperative um, and collective of black families in Philadelphia um, that had, had built, uh, had managed to build so much generational wealth that they could create their own compound uh, in the heart of Philadelphia on Osage Ave. And um, the white neighbors that had gentrified into the area, much like what we see with Barbecue Becky's and, and the Karens of the world, uh, really took issue with seeing them do what I think are normal things like walk their dogs every day, um, walk their babies to school. Uh, when you go back and look at public comments from that time in that area, a lot of the complaints were about um, white people not wanting to see black women with, with dreads, with locks. Um, that groundswell of hatred, that groundswell of, of racism um, escalated and culminated into the state sanctioned bombing of the entire complex. But get this, um, was it Mayor Rizzo? Rizzo was over the, um, Rizzo has had several positions, so I forget what his title was at this time. Uh, but I think it was Mayor Rizzo at the time. Um, sanctioned the bombing and, and destruction of the complex, but waited for the men in the household um, to be out of the home, right? Um, to be out of the home before bombing them. So that the only people that were left in the home when the bombing took place were the women and the children. When I think about Brianna Taylor, and I know that the two situations are not synonymous, but when I think about what it means to be asleep in your bed, um, while a state faction is conspiring um, to either track down and kill you or track down and kill some man that is in some way connected to you and your life, even while you're asleep, uh, not being worthy of, of the decency of a knock on the door. Um, you know, it is not lost on me that that even in, in our homes, there is this constant threat of harm. So, so what does it mean to, to champion notions of outside, uh, right? Through slow streets and open streets pr programs and even beautiful, um, beautiful um, pop-up architecture like what I'm seeing in, in LA with the alfresco dining. What does it mean for black women who know that both inside and outside, they won't be safe. Then there's this burden of black women having to be the protectors of place. So while not being safe in homes, we are burdened with um, having to, to lead the fight um, for keeping and making place for everyone else who also does not have access to home. And so this is a photo from, um, Moms for Housing uh, in, in, in West Oakland this January. I was working in Oakland while this was happening and uh, it, it really moved me to see droves of communities come out to protect these moms. They had, they had occupied what was a vacant and abandoned home in, um, in West Oakland. West, Oakland itself has an issue with out of town uh, landlords and developers. So what happens is we have, we don't have enough housing, available housing stock to house the people who are currently without shelter. Um, the city of Oakland, their most recent um, unhoused count was somewhere around 5,500 people on the street. Um, they have 
an available housing stock upwards of 15,000 vacant units, not vacant beds, vacant units. 85% of those are owned by speculators that refuse to put occupants um, in the structures because they're waiting for the, the value of the property to go up and for the neighborhoods to continue to gentrify. So Moms for Housing uh, made a beautiful radical statement by identifying where these vacant speculative um, units were located um, and moving homeless moms and families and children into those homes and then guarding and protecting the thresholds just so that um, these families could have shelter during the dead of the winter. The way this saga ended in January, I believe, or maybe, yeah, January of this year, um, the Alameda County Sheriff's Department um, delivered an eviction notice uh, by way of a military tank. So a military sized tank, one that you see in combat war, pulled up to the, the house that these women were occupying just to serve the eviction notice. Uh, the initial tank was so large that it couldn't turn down the street. They had to turn around, get a smaller tank and then come back. This is the extent to which our government agencies are going out of their way to make place an impossible notion uh, for black women. Um, and, and again, it is not lost on me that despite these traumas and this harm, um, Black women are the ones who have to lead the fight to protect themselves and everyone around them. Similarly, I met a young woman named Kaishan uh, in South Central LA in 2019 while doing a, a community engagement event for youth. Uh, she lives on a street that that hasn't seen. Uh, actually, I saw a news article um, this morning. It got it finally finished. Um, they finally finished the implementation of the project. Um, but prior to to this year, that street hadn't seen any meaningful repair or investment in forty in some forty years in some places, sixty years in other segments of the of the corridor. Uh, so it needed a complete reconstruction. And when we finally um, were able to get the resources to do the project in a way that we felt was dignified um, and, and truly complete, not just vertical elements and paint, but, but reconstruction, um, retrofitting of the public works infrastructure, like the plumbing and the pipes beneath the roadway, um, fixing, helping businesses and homes fix their frontages so that the roadway didn't look newer than the homes themselves. Uh, really comprehensive effort to resource this and, and do right by this community. And um, I met this seven-year-old girl and we had these whiteboards where we would ask the question of um, why do you love this project or what do, you, what do you love about being outside? No matter what question we asked, her response was, I like being inside. Um, and even when we asked her why, her response being because that's safe, um, we asked why is safety important? And her response was, I just feel safe when I'm inside. And, you know, we talk a lot about in broad, like general discourse in society, uh, we, we're hearing more frequently about Black families, families having to have the talk. Uh, with black boys and their black children uh, regarding how to engage with police and, and to make it home alive essentially. But um, I was both hurt and fascinated by uh, Kaishan's analysis of space uh, and, and that she, she couldn't be swayed in her understanding that she was born into a society and into a community where plain and simply there was nothing you could offer her that would make her feel or know safety outside of her home. And, and even, even with that, uh, when we pressed her on that, um, she insisted that not only did she feel safest in home, in her home, but that she only felt safe um, at the back side of her home, right? And so this early analysis, you, we've already talked about 
the burden of having to protect place, the constant threat of harm. What does it mean to carry carry this level of consciousness in you um, as a seven year old? What are we doing? And then, you know, not only being responsible for um, being conscious and protecting space, protecting others, um, but then having to do the work of healing ourselves and healing each other because no one else will take the time to do it this June, um, just Juneteenth, June 18th, in honor of um, or to, to pay respects to Ahmaud Arbery, who was shot down while jogging um, in Georgia. Um, shot in the back, hunted down by white vigilantes. Um, he ran 2.3 miles and I accidentally watched the video and it was actually playing on the news um, in the background while I was cleaning up. And I um, wasn't, I said I wouldn't watch it, right? And I thought I could get through the sound, you know? And there was a noise at the end of the clip that they played um, where you could hear Ahmad take his last breath. And it broke me. To, even right now, it, it, it is emotionally disturbing to think about uh, how familiar I am with that sound. It's the same sound that I heard on the um, Trayvon Martin tape. Um, it is a sound that I've heard in my own life as people um, transition. And that sound never left. It echoed and, and it kept me up. And so we created the Unurbanist Assembly, was what, which was our confrontation of the legacy of racism um, in the built environment uh, by virtue of urbanism. And it was a 23-hour teaching where we had 8,000 active and captive participants for 23 hours straight. But one of the sessions um, that I was asked to have um, that we very much needed was for Black women and femmes. And, you know, I was managing the whole event. It was my protest, so I had to be, you know, available and managing the logistics. But I remember logging into that Black women and femmes special assembly private room and it was silent. No one knew what to say. And one person said one sentence and it was in, and I feel like it may have been 30 seconds before everyone in the space was crying. There is such a great immense amount of, of, of need for spaces and places that support the healing and repair of black women who have been carrying these burdens on their shoulders, in their wombs, um, in their minds, and in their hearts for so, so, so many years. That is why I think um, carrying forward um, the imperative of, of womanism is, is the right thing to do when it, when it comes to imagining the future of urbanism and all of the built practices. So what is womanism? Womanism is the outrageous, audacious, courageous, um, or willful behavior. It's wanting to know more and in greater depth, in greater depth than is considered good for one. So it's this relentless critique, constant questioning, disregard for notions of good because we know that those notions don't serve us. It's a commitment to the survival and wholeness of an entire people. The difference between womanism and feminism uh, lives in this, in this sentence, in this framing. Um, feminism encompasses the blessing and the privilege um, of being able to hold oneself um, in mind and in praxis um, as just their gender, right? Separate from the other genders, um, and even separate from other races sometimes. Being a womanist is about understanding your connection, the irrevocable, the inextricable link between blackness and womanhood, right? By virtue of how society has constructed us. You can't break those things apart. 
And it is an understanding of how that that being, that identity um, exists within relation to everyone else who needs, who anticipates, who feeds, um, and who loves Black women. It, it's, you can't, we, womanists, as opposed to feminists, uh, we don't detach ourselves from the, the context of the, of the whole. It's this will to have, to experience, and to create joy regardless. And it's important for me here to emphasize that what I'm not getting at is resilience. I think resilience is, is a part of the cycle of trauma. Um, but, you know, when we hear folks mention Black girl magic, uh, when, we hear, when we hear people talk about um, that unspoken language, right, the rhythm that's just kind of in us, um, even as babies, um, it, is our, it is our will and connection to um, an unrelenting desire to have and to create joy, regardless of what's going on around us. And as Alice Walker puts it, uh, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. So I wanna talk for a moment about what it could look like or, or what it would look like to reignite Alice Walker's search. Um, her, her text, her book is called In, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. And what it is is a collection of essays that kind of walk us through her own growth process and transition in, in the ways that she thinks about herself, the ways that she thinks about the Black community, um, but also the ways um, in which she sees Black women in space and in the built environment. Um, I read this, this book or this collection of essays while I was in that summer class that my mom forced me to be in. Uh, it was the first time that I got to imagine and to read um, a validated official text that situated the Black woman as a whole being. Up until then, I could only know Black womanhood by virtue of our utility to others. Um, but through her writings, I found myself and I found what it means to be a Black woman in, in place um, separate from what folks need and demand of me in those spaces. Uh, what if our, what if place accomplished this? Like what if our work as designers, as scholars, as implementers and creators of policies accomplished this notion? So there were a few um, sort of themes that showed up in In Search of Our Mother's Gardens that I thought really resonated with um, how I imagine our mother's urbanism being and our mothers, our mothers having already given us the juice, already given us the ideas, already given us the creativity um, to inform and to imagine uh, what place could be in, a, in, in terms of how place could be in service of us. And those themes include uh, this notion of having a rad radical imagination. Imagination is not something that comes easily to those of us who um, are responsible for immense amount of reproductive labor or who have exposure to um, any kind of trauma, but especially uh, place-based trauma. And so there, there is work to be done um, to enhance the muscle, the imagination muscle um, so that Black women can begin to be participants in the imagining of, of place and of space um, in radical ways that look nothing like what we have today. There's also this theme of critical collectivity, um, this, this, this link, this bond, um, these kinship formations, this desire to assemble for, or to have assemblages, this notion that, that you can be um, of a community and not in it, or in a community and not of it, um, and both of those positionalities having some value, thinking critically about what it means to be connected um, and resisting what common um, planning practices have told us are the standard modes of connectivity or collectivity. 
plain we put, um, our mother's gardens or the tools that they have given us uh, remind us that it's really about liberation and liberation only. So, so we're not accepting of alternatives to things that we know only perpetuate cycles of harm. Um, we're not okay with um, sim having similar um, outcomes or, or even does, we don't even desire to have what anyone else has. We seek a true sense of lim liberation um, and that is the only outcome that we actually desire in our work as womanist practitioners of the built environment. So what does that look like literally? Um, I wrote an article earlier this year um, after the killing of Breonna Taylor um, that sort of listed the ways in which um, spatial reparations could be accomplished. Before I get into that, I wanna remind you um, of Alice Walker's uh, quote, right? So these are things that our mothers and grandmothers have um, already handed down, started to grow, cultivated, um, even, even when they couldn't name or plainly speak what those things were, they made sure that we had them to carry forward. And I wanna add to that, um, and the, the name of James Baldwin's essay is escaping me, but uh, in this same summer class, I encountered James Baldwin for the first time and was reading this passage, this book about, uh, or this chapter about what um, hit this character's experience was like being um, queer and being black in the Jim Crow South and how just being in the Jim Crow South or being home was rife with so much trauma that he never had the mental capacity, time or safety to explore his sexuality in a way that was um, forthcoming. And he, he moved to, to Paris, I believe. And he has this very, very beautiful explanation, this narrative description of uh, what it felt like in his body to be able to gaze at and admire um, someone that he was attracted to and to completely be able to live in that uh, without fear of, of retribution for that sentiment. But what didn't leave him was the fear of being um, victimized or cr criminalized uh, because of his blackness. And he sums that passage up um, with this quote, perhaps home is not a place, but simply an irrevocable condition. And I just wanna say, before I get into these uh, recommendations for reparative or liberative um, strategies in the built environment, um, no matter what we do, it will be impossible to remove the legacy, the trauma of the Ma'afa from the bloodline, from the DNA, from the, from the consciousness of, of black people who have had to live that reality for so long. It is an irrevocable condition, but that doesn't mean um, that we can't at least be harm reductive in our approach. So at the Thrivance Group, we started this year uh, researching and imagining, radically imagining what it would be like to have a comprehensive package for reparations through urbanism. And this is not our list of interventions from our action plan, which will be announced in January or, or shared in January. Um, but this is the list that um, I came up with for the article that I wrote um, after Breonna Taylor was killed. Um, I'm gonna run through these really quickly so that we have time for questions. But uh, the first thing on the list, and you'll notice that this is a coupling or a pairing of um, place-based intervention and policy to sustain that intervention for, on each line. Um, I recommended cargo and freight prohibitions. Uh, what we have seen um, you know, in, in our lived experience as well as through our research is that um, communities that are most likely to, um, to have poor health health outcomes as it relates to greenhouse gas emissions um, are communities where there's um, excessive amounts of freight and cargo being moved um, through the neighborhood. So we like to see a prohibition on things like that. And in addition to that, uh, a revenue tax 
um, cargo and freight movement movement happening in the vicinity to atone and atone for and restore um, communities that are already experiencing the negative impacts of uh, the legacy of environmental racism. We'd like to see a recall of wayfinding um, that fortifies or reifies the criminalization of no, of mobility. Right. Um, when I moved to LA six or seven years ago, um, I remember going to Crenshaw and still seeing an old, probably vintage um, wayfinding sign that said no cruising. Um, and thinking about how that statement in and of itself was in conflict with the public safety campaign that was begging drivers to slow down and thinking about how many people had been uh, pulled over, stopped, frisked, maybe even killed as a result of that sign. So, so we wanna see um, widespread removal of possible wayfinding um, signage that reinforces um, restrictions on freedom of movement. And we wanna couple that with uh, fine reversals and economic support for people who have already been criminalized um, by virtue of mobility. We wanna see deep planning and low cost or no cost freedom of movement. So that project on Avalon is an example of that, not just putting uh, temporary or cheap elements down on a street that needs to be reconstructed or above, um, or a street that is above toxic, literal toxic landfill. Um, we wanna see um, a concerted effort by all public works agencies to do deep planning um, in partnership with one another, uh, not as separate entities with, without the context of each other. We wanna see a divestment from policing and an investment in service, direct service provision. We wanna see the prioritization of public works um, coupled with universal basic income. These two are together because our communities need so much work um, that the construction is going to be incredibly disruptive um, to the daily, the daily lives and, and economic stability of any community. Um, and so we think that a universal basic in income should be applied to areas that are, that are experiencing this type of revitalization. We wanna see community-based planning, community by, planning by the community, not just planning in the community, um, and a reclassification of civil service um, positions uh, such that um, people can plan for their own communities without having to navigate um, the, uh, the traditional um, educational or academic uh, requirements. The reason we're recommending this is because we find that uh, nine times out of 10, when we do get around to doing community engagement, the community itself um, has already planned uh, for what they need and, and what they want. So we just need to get out of the way. Want to see transit enhancements like shelters and, and non-hostile infrastructure, so benches that unhoused people can lay on. Um, and we want to see more investments in neighborhood network connectivity as opposed to the transport of commuters through and around our neighborhoods at the expense of our neighborhoods. We wanna see land trusts, cooperatives, and civil, civil fee waivers. We wanna see restorative zoning, not just up zoning. So we want context with the zoning changes that are happening, coupled with the right of return. So we want people who've been displaced to be able um, to return, even if that has to be subsidized. We want a prohibition on surveillance that is affixed to any infrastructure in the built environment coupled with a tech tax, a tech tax um, on the industries that are innovating, collecting our data and selling that data um, in order to fund further um, displacing um, infrastructure projects. And lastly, we wanna see an intentional investment in anti-displacement policies. Um, and we wanna see racial composition added as a factor, a community um, impact factor in all environmental protection uh, regulations. I want to end by sharing this picture of my mother, who I am so grateful for. Um, this is a picture of our matching Ankh tattoos. My mother gave me the knowledge of the trauma of my author um, at an early age, just like that seven-year-old 
um, but she gave it to me in a way that helped me understand um, that I can still be a whole being um, and that I can demand that other people treat me that way and plan for me um, in that context. So um, the Thrivance group, this is the work that we do. Um, our word Thrivance um, is a direct reference to intersectionality. And we assert that the solutions and responses to interlocking systems of oppression must also be interlocking systems, which lead to holistic thriving. Thank you. I'll take a few questions. Thank you so much. I like, I can't get everyone to unmute because <laughs> it's not a normal Zoom, but just imagine that everyone's clapping super hard Thank in you. their homes. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read some of the questions from the Q and A. Um, just some shout outs from Dr. Willie Wright of Rutgers University. Uh, Willie says, wow, ma'afa, please speak on it and really appreciating this deep black geographic history lesson. I agree the way that you tied together all of those different regimes from sharecropping to redlining was, um, and currently with this placement, the, the criminalization, um, Amar Sid talks about Thank you for talking about displacement and stating criminalization that contributes to this. The gang injunctions were a huge tool used to enforce and justify the youth criminalization supported by planning bodies. The gang injunctions are still taking place uh, where they are still enforcing black and brown men and women cannot walk down the street with a similar color on. And so we see this, I mean, every single yeah. There's uh, wonderful students at Rutgers, in fact, doing work on nightlife in Kansas City around some of these same um, forms of surveillance. So it, it's wonderful to see that. Snaps from one of our second year planning students, Ebony Hawkins. Um, and we have, um, now for the questions. We've got a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the first is from um, Amanda Pina, who asks, how did you come to create Thrivance and what was the process like until its launch this year? Um, we are yet thriving. Um, the Thrivance group came about in a number of ways. It was a project at first. I was doing an investigation on the connection between trauma and the built environment for my doctoral program. And because of my own trauma, um, would, would, you know, I was experiencing depression and anxiety. And just after spending 12 hours a day interviewing people about their trauma, and, and I had a great therapist who said, you know, if this is how you feel when you leave these sessions, imagine how people feel, the, the other people feel, you know, while they're still in the situation. And so she said, if you're going to survive this, this program, and if you really want to do this work, you have to figure out a way to do it uh, without hurting yourself. And so um, I really set out to create a way to engage people um, from the intersection of joy. And as, a, as, a, as an act of resistance, though, I can't stress that enough. I, I'm not into respectability politics or resilience at all. Um, but, but what does like, defiant joy look like and you know I was a social worker at the time I was also houseless myself living in a car in LA for eight months and uh the method worked the the usual the typical caseload for someone working with transition age youth was like seven seven clients I had like 22 clients on my caseload because my clients were having such positive outcomes. And so I, I, um, I formalized the method, which at the time was the Thrivance method, but people used to call me that girl doing that Thrivance project. And so I created a landing page because I wanted people looking for the girl doing the Thrivance project to be able to find me for my research. So we had the Thrivance project um, and I've carried this method with me through every discipline in every field that I've ever worked in. Um, and so when I interviewed for my second planning job, I, my, my first planning job was as an indigenous liaison, um, transportation environmental planner for the state of California. My second job though, was with the city of LA. And when I interviewed in my interview, I said, I really want this job, but if you give me this job, I need you to let me do it this way. And they did. And while I was at LADOT, 
that Thrivance method evolved into dignity infused community engagement, where we created a sequence um, and, a, and, a, and a praxis, a system of practice um, that brought the Thrivance method um, into the built environment more inten intentionally. And uh, I shook tables, it, uh, folks were shook. And it made some people uncomfortable. Why are you talking to the community about displacement? Why are you telling them their rights in terms of civic engagement? What's going on? And so um, that started to feel dangerous to me. And um, I made the decision to take my retirement money and start a company called the Thrivens Project. I mean, the Thrivens Group. And we call it the Thrivens Group because now there are other um, disciplines besides and practices besides projects um, that we apply the method to. And Thrivance Group was born on April 16, 2020. We've had a, a 10 years worth of a year. It's been quite a year to launch a new business in the midst of the pandemic. For sure. um, Lizette Mendez asks, what is the role of environmental justice in vulnerable communities as you outline place-based interventions and policy changes? Yeah, so there is a distinction that we forget about uh, between environmental justice and climate resilience work. Um, climate resilience work is about um, moderating consumption, um, making conscious decisions um, for the greater good, to reduce our impacts on greenhouse gas emissions and other negative impacts on the environment and the earth. Great work, necessary work. Environmental justice work is about naming the intentionality of environmental racism um, through, through land planning, through, through um, land use planning um, and policies, as well as through the, the siting the how we choose sites and locations for what we know to be toxic industries. Um, and so the work of, of climate resilience in a black community, in a brown community, a low income community, is also the work of um, rooting out environmental racism or doing environmental justice work. Um, they're actually two very different um, fields. It's it's less in environment in the context of environmental justice it's less about moderating consumption and making conscious decisions and it's more about harm reduction um, and resolving um, disparity existing disparity um, and people get that twisted a lot and I'm, I'm noticing that our environmental justice conversations are morphing into um, these conversations around how black communities or brown communities should change or transform or shift in order to be healthier. Um, and what we're missing there is the resolution or the, the resolving of, or dissolving of existing policies and practices that will continue to kill us um, and to, to make our environments toxic, whether we moderate our consumption or not. Thank you um, for that clarification and distinction. Um, the next question comes from Sama Safiula. Um, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. What are steps that traditional planners can take to lessen single family residential zoning ordinances? Okay, I don't know what steps you can take because I'm not on that side of the issue. I'm sorry for those of you who thought you loved me but now hate me, but I'm just not on that side of the issue. I come from Oakland. I come from a city where the headquarters of the Black Panther Party was a Victorian home. Um, and so when I hear things like let's ban, ban the uh, development of single family houses and let's um, ban single family zoning, I see the benefits and understand them and agree with that. But I also think about, again, going back to In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, um, we had we black folks, brown folks, Asian folks have been housing multiple generations of families of our own families and of others' families um, in single family homes since the beginning of homes. The original structure, as the description I read um, mentioned, for black families in this country 
was a shack that had no floors and housed five families at a time. So uh, there is a way in which we have come to, to know kinship um, and to form bonds and to gather, uh, to assemble, uh, to protect ourselves that um, is very much linked to single family homes as an ideal. Um, that's not to say we can't move toward um, a more dense reality when it comes from um, zone when it comes to zoning, but going back to the the distinction between climate resilience work and environmental justice work, um, who who should who should continue to carry the burden of uh, adaptation and shifting um, in the name of saving everyone else? I would argue that it isn't black women. So let us get our single family homes first. Many of us don't have them and, and are still striving. And meanwhile, I think it's great that everyone else wants to live in multi-unit dwellings. I, I am, I'm not there. I live in an apartment. I've never lived in a house. Um, and, I, and I can imagine um, how much of a resource and a help I could be to my own family if I did have a, a house a single family home. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, was that- Sorry, um, don't unfollow me on Twitter. <laughs> you're canceled. <laughs> um, so Amanda Pena has um, another question. Um, given the broad scope of these interventions and policy changes for spatial repara reparations, what is the role of the city planner for helping these recommendations take root? And how does a collectivist effort begin to grow? To whom are these recommendations made? Yeah, so this laundry list of recommendations is um, not like a one size fits all, it's a, it's a kitchen sink approach. And so I just sat down and imagined all the different types of geographies and landscapes and urban conditions that I myself am aware of and created a list of interventions that I think could work uh, across those spec the spectrum. Uh, but to that end, um, I think that there is, um, I think I'm making a call today uh, for traditional planners to become unurbanist planners or to become womanist planners and to begin um, to, to leverage their positionality and their access to power and decision making, uh, to be more intentional, to be more harm reductive. You don't have to get anyone's opinion to do that, right? The, these are decisions that you make. It's how you draw the lines on the paper. It's how you um, choose to record or not record a public comment. It is um, your willingness to ask the tough questions in your staff meetings. It's your um, constant reminder uh, to, to invite a Black planner to the space um, to yield to them or to invite community in the space to yield to them. Anyone who has proximity to um, institutional power, um, I would encourage you to reconsider the ways in which we define planners in and of themselves. I think planners are social workers. I think planners are psychologists. I think planners are housing navigators. I think planners are artists artists and painters. Um, and it's time to uh, really begin to critique and disrupt what we know to be planning. And I know that is, that is in and of itself a scary idea, um, but I encourage you to be um, as distant from what you know to be urbanism as, as possible. Um, and so these recommendations are for everyone, for community, for people to um, rise up in community and, and demand these types of interventions, for planners to put them into practice, practice, and for decision makers to be on notice that these recommendations are coming. Because it's liberation only over here. <laughs> that is the short answer. <laughs> um, Krista Hayward um, says, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. You talked about how it's hard to get people who have experienced trauma to think imaginatively. Do you have any thoughts about how to reinvigorate the imagination? Yes, so I was just watching a YouTube video this morning. There's a woman who does the work of, um, she calls it, I think, activist joy. I'm going to look it up while I'm talking, but um, you are absolutely right. It is, it is difficult um, 
for people who are experiencing or have experienced trauma or are raised and reared by people who've been traumatized um, to tap into imagination. And I think that is why um, when we think about um, place-based interventions, um, we need to be more fluid and flexible in our conceptual thinking. Um, so the rigidity of um, delineating a space for a bike or using cones to block off a roadway for people who are walking, that type of rigidity um, stifles the opportunity and potential of imagination. And I'm not saying that those interventions can't or don't work, um, but they should come by way of community going through an imaginative process. Um, so it's about giving access to people. Um, her name is Adrian Marie Brown. Pleasure activism is, is what her work is. There's a book um, and a YouTube video. Um, but, but, you know, it's a good question. What I came up with was the Thrivance method. So not engaging people from the point of their trauma, uh, redirecting their um, attention to what feels and is good. Uh, we have a planner at the Thrivance group. Her name is Brittany Brown, and she's been taking this Thrivance method to heart. We're in the middle of our Dignity Institute, so we're learning about the method um, in depth. Um, and, you know, she hit me up one night and was like, I know we're doing this oral history project about anti-displacement, but I feel like in the spirit of Thrivance, it's not a question of where is the displacement and how it's happened. It's a question of what makes this home. Right, and so that's a way of reframing um, our engagement with folks to, to begin to um, remove the layers of scabs um, and dead skin so that folks can, can start to imagine again. And maybe it's not imagination yet, maybe it's a reckoning back too, right? I love my mother, I love what my mother taught me. I'm always thinking about what she taught me in the moments where I can't imagine what comes next. That was great. Um, a question in the Q&A about your where to find your doctoral research. Ah, um, so if you have it, trash. it's trash. Of course it is. Well, it's but. not trash, but you know, I had mentors <laughs> that were like, don't do too much with this. Just mm -hmm. Get a done. good, a good doctor is a doctor. You know what I'm saying? Like good PhD is a, P a PhD. And so um, actually I'm proud of it. My dissertation was called um, Why Hashtag Black Lives Matter, um, colon, uh, interrogating the Black plight narrative. And the whole research was about um, how do we disrupt this notion of Black plight? Because I, at the time, felt like it was the narrative of Black plight um, that was reifying the plight itself. I've evolved in my understanding Mm -hmm. But I feel like um, the theoretical grounding is certainly there. Um, and the journey that I took to arrive at Thrivance um, theory is, is also there. Thank you. So look on ProQuest dissertation. It's, it's free. Yeah, it's free. Yeah. I was shocked to find that myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a um, question from Shay Friedenlund. Um, apologies if I've mispronounced. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. My question is related to your work with Thrivance and your nuanced approach to social reproduction feminism. Your work reflects Black Marxist and Black feminist critiques of capitalism, particularly, especially in your attention to Black women's increased social reproduction burdens. How do you situate for profit work in relation to capitalist social relations that depend on the subjugation of gendered Black and Brown bodies? Yeah, so we show up in the in the capitalist um, space as disruptors. So we're participating as disruptors, um, and we show up outside of normative uh, assumptions and impositions of our identities. And so I can't tell you, even when we're interviewing candidates um, to be planners, in in like their opening statement, there's this whole monologue about how, oh, I would love to work for a nonprofit firm. Um, and, and so we are literally in, in the space disrupting um, normativity and um, combating the erasure of the labor 
of Black women that has come before us. So we're taking on um, the role of technical practitioners solely for the purposes of, of intervening and dismantling the system itself. That's why our brand is called Unurbanist. We're very clear about what our intention is, intention is in this space. Thank you for that really sort of thoughtful response. Um, we only have time for two more questions and we have way more than that in the chat. So I'm just gonna summarize. Talia Kurtzman is an undergrad studying geography and urban planning. Your talk has liberated me and made me more excited about the scope of what anti-racist and womanist planning can look like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, geography. Monica, I know, big time. Monica, there's a lot of geographers in this room. <laughs> Monica, um, yes, the presentation will be posted. We're recording it. Um, she'd like to say that she'd like to go back and listen again, given so many great points. I appreciate you and your work. Thank Monica you. Gutierrez. Um, all right. Um, Paula Mann says that um, they live in New Orleans, and how can I get involved with this type of work? I'm very excited about the things you are doing. In New Orleans, is that is it New Orleans? That's where we're trying to go. Hit me up, DM me on Twitter. We're trying to, to work there. All right, making connections. Okay, um, so Ebony Hawkins and Sawad Mana kind of have similar questions. What does it look like for planners to move beyond integrating racial justice as mm -hmm. just a language in their reports plans to actually implementing this? And mm -hmm. Ebony kind of piggybacks and says, you know, you're lecturing across the country. What do you want an upcoming generation of black planners, especially those at key WIs, predominantly white institutions to know or do? Yeah, to, to thank you for that question. Um, I think that we are moving out of a season where we're going to continue to have these lectures and lessons on uh, racial justice. Um, and I think it's because of the ways in which we've been, not just us, but we broadly have been disruptive. One of my strategies, one, actually our, um, our strategic plan for our business has been to take this um, double-sided approach to scaling our work and to scaling our capacity. And so we have an internal capacity uh, building effort, you know, uh, professional development, things like that. But we are also offering um, slightly subsidized, subsidized um, capacity building externally. And, and But we've made a business line out of it. And our strategy is to... Um, to galvanize, to mobilize, to organize enough traditional planners who have access to privilege and power, um, to think the way that we think, to carry our frameworks um, forward so that when we get to like year three, when we're ready to innovate and implement, we already have likely partners, right? There are already people who are um, aware of, well-versed in and leaning into this approach. And we're not starting from square one, trying to convince folks that black equals human. Um, and so there are those among us um, in our community of, of Black practitioners who have taken on um, the labor and the burden of um, transmuting um, these, these concepts in ways that um, I think do a good job of bridging, bridging dialect um, in terms of praxis um, and narrative, but also aren't compromising. Uh, one thing I can't stand um, is an intentional effort to soften the blow. We don't do that, but we also don't do um, like equity one-on-one -on -one work. Our work is um, thematically based on this construct of dignity, which we definitely don't have time to get into, but we have this whole analysis of how dignity is constructed on the body um, and in place, uh, which gels well with and tracks closely with um, how race has been um, constructed. So we start with dignity um, as a construct. And then once we feel um, our participants, our students have a, a grasp on the concept, then we reveal to them that the whole time it was critical race theory. So that's our strategy. It's been it's been working. We've been getting we've been in pro projects for it. Our current Dignity Institute has 300 um, practitioners in it. It's a nine week process, but it is definitely an investment and hopefully a worthwhile one um, so that our emerging practitioners don't have to do this kind of work. Awesome. 
We have one more question, but just a follow up from Shay. Thank you for the response. I also agree with your response to the question of single family housing. Yes, geography, exclamation points, geography post doc at 10. Working on housing and labor, but don't have a strong background in planning. You have inspired me to change this. Thank you again. Whoa. It's all planning. Yeah, We're going to burn do down planning. Yeah, don't don't get too attached to planning. We're I about to redress that. <laughs> Wait. <till> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, final question from Ajil Gaut, uh, one of our second year students. <laughs> Shay, you just got here. How are you running it down? Um, so thank you. Can you elaborate on the concept of restorative zoning? How is this related to the restorative mm -hmm. justice? And what are some of the outcomes yep. of restorative zoning in contrast to what previous Today, that will be our last question. Take us out. <laughs> okay. No, I love that you made the connection between restorative zoning and restorative justice because I think I forgot to say that. Um, but restorative zoning is not the same as like upzoning. Upzoning is is everything should be dense and we're going to save the world. Um, restorative zoning, zoning um, is contextually grounded in the legacy of racism. Um, and, and slavery's impacts um, in the built environment. And so um, it, is, it is a demand that we um, even redefine what we know to be zoning, right? Name it differently, um, honor different um, informal uses and functions, um, and also disrupt um, what have been harmful zoning practices but they're not harmful just by virtue of what, how the zone is named, if that makes sense. So disrupting um, who gets to leverage um, the notion of a zone to begin with. And, and some of the outcomes of restorative zoning to me um, look like affinity-based zoning, which I know sounds like segregation, uh, but isn't. I think that there are other um, homogenous um, cultural assemblages um, that that need to be protected and fortified as we transition into this new um, this new age of planning. And again, I think about our work in Fresno, and when I got a chance to do the the research on the history of um, the commodification of agriculture, there's a very strong bond there between the Latinx community, the indigenous community, and the Hmong community and the Black community all of which work together um, to, to really push sharecropping out um, and to, to advocate for what labor, labor practices and laws that the entire country gets to enjoy. Um, so that's an example of an affinity um, group that I think deserves um, a place-based intervention that names them um, through zoning. So that's, that's uh, one example. And I think that tying that to a right to return, right? So also specifically naming um, who was displaced and harmed as a result of the legacy is just as important of changing the way we do things moving forward. And I hope that's helpful. I'm just trying to be succinct because of the time. That was very helpful. Derek Flora, equity is a crucial lens. We must assist all people to access the resources to enable them to achieve their potential. I am so grateful for your talk today, which has inspired me in this pursuit and hope that more people can work to undo the legacies of discrimination and transform it into a future of thrivance. All caps. Yeah. The Thank legacy you. of discrimination is slavery though. Let's, let's, we got to name it. But thank you for that. I'm glad you're inspired and um, I cannot wait to share our action plan in January. Um, the Unurbanist Assembly is free. It's an annual event. So as soon as you see the registration information um, for that, I think it's already live. Go live on unurbanist.com. Um, please sign up very soon. We'll put it, be putting out a call for guest teachers for that teaching as well. Mm, fantastic. Thank you so much. Again, I wish we could mute and you could hear everyone loudly 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 clapping for you Thank yeah you for... let's let's uh let's unmute and, and clap oh, oh. I, I don't know I don't, I don't know. know at least the panelists can unmute we can do it oh okay right, right. yeah that's i'll fine. take the panel applause okay cool I, <laughs> i'm like having to ask everyone to unmute now so i apologize but i will just start talking thank you thank, thank you so much for joining us thank you to all of
all of you all for zooming in at this hour on the East Coast. I appreciate it and everyone from all over. Um, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you, City Planning and Whitesmith for hosting this. And we hope to have you back again. We really appreciate this. Absolutely.